It is almost 11 a.m. in Singapore and Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Haslinda Amin. And I'm Stephen Engel outside the Great Hall of the People in central Beijing, where Premier Li Chang has just delivered his annual work report, promising to deliver around 5% GDP growth. But he also admits that it's going to be a tough task without policy support. And the other top stories, markets remain cautious on China's growth target as skepticism persists over whether policy moves will be forceful enough and Bitcoin back near its all-time high with bulls now eyeing 70,000. And with that, the meme coin frenzy also returns as Deutsche Coin outperforms the original cryptocurrency. In the markets, it is about China, it is about the NPC, it is about that around 5% and growth target. Uh, ambitious, they say, because of the higher base versus last year. Also, a budget deficit of 3% of GDP, which some say is pretty uninspiring. The CSI 300 index, the benchmark, reversing earlier losses, now in gains, boosted after Li Chiang talked about plans for urbanization, regional development. Traders say, while there are not many bright spots, what is important is that there are no scarce. Talks about uh, how... Uh, uh, the the benchmark is really low. CSI eking out some gains so far. No abnormal ETF trades, they say so. Perhaps the national team is not in play. Hang Seng Index currently down by 2.5%. We're also keeping an eye on uh, the Nikkei 225, now below the 40,000 level, consolidating at about that level. Now, our focus is on China and Premier Li Qiang presenting his work report to kick off the MPC with a growth target of about 5% for the year. Let's listen. In setting these targets, we considered involving a dynamic and home and abroad and other relevant factors. And it is not easy for us to realize these targets. We need policy support and joint effort from all fronts. Chinese assets showing stability. CSI 300 index four tenths of one percent higher. The Hang Seng under a lot of pressure there. The yuan 720.96, pretty stable, but supported by the fix. And of course, the Chinese 10-year yield. Well, not much reaction there, uh, despite plans for special government bonds worth one trillion yuan or 540 million dollars. Let's get insights perspective. Our team is on the ground. Chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Angle on the ground in Beijing and our Asia Activities. Report, a reporter, rather, Charlotte Yang in Hong Kong. Steve, what stands out from Lee's report? Well, we shouldn't have had so much expectations as we all had because, again, these work reports tend to uh, spell out oftentimes what we already know. What we do know that the economy is uh, sputtering. 2023 was not a very strong year, obviously. So a lot of people were looking for clues as to policy support going forward from this work report. And he did talk, you know, Lee Chang, the premier, in his first work report, talked in sort of broad brush strokes about the challenges. You just heard from him saying, you know, a growth target of around 5%, which is the same, by the way, as last year, is not going to be an easy task without some policy support. But again, so far, this government, uh, the third term, of course, under Xi Jinping as president, uh, has been very cautious. They do not want to exacerbate uh, the debt loads at local governments. They do not want to exacerbate uh, debt issues in the property market. They want to, as Li Chang said, you know, find the root causes of the debt and property woes. But how are they going to do that? This is going to be a step-by-step -step process, not a big bang uh, injection of fiscal stimulus, because you mentioned those special bonds. That will go hand-in-hand, -hand, uh, essentially, with what he also announced, and that is a fairly modest uh, debt budget deficit to GDP ratio of just 3%. That's the same 
amount as last year. Some were expecting them uh, to, to increase that because they're going to need more fiscal support for this economy, but not necessarily so. But at the same time, for just the fourth time in 26 years, uh, they're issuing uh, the central government special longer term bonds of to the tune of about a trillion yuan. That will be that will help, obviously, uh, with their fiscal uh, constraints uh, or, or their fiscal spending, I should say, at a time when they're trying to implement further fiscal constraints. So there wasn't a big, big headline other than a fairly ambitious, given the headwinds of the economy, a fairly ambitious GDP target of around 5 percent, same as last year. Uh, Steve, going into the MPC, people were also looking out for defense spending. It is up 7.2 percent, and some say that's pretty modest. Yes, but it's also the highest increase in five years. So there's no doubt that the Chinese uh, government wants to modernize the People's Liberation Army, and they are doing that as well. Uh, but this increase in military spending comes at a time when there is obviously increased geopolitical tensions. There is still, yes, the U.S. and the Chinese militaries have agreed to have dialogue again, but there's still a frosty relationship there. Uh, it centers around the differences over Taiwan, obviously. It's a U.S. election year in the United States, so there could be more rhetoric there. There's the ongoing conflict, obviously, in Ukraine, and there is continued saber rattlings from North Korea. So, uh, again, regional neighbors will be watching this number quite uh, closely, as we always do, as well as the United States. So a 7.2 percent increase in the military budget, the most in five years, is not insignificant, has Linda. And, and, and Charlotte, let's talk about markets. CSI 300 index reversing all losses, currently up about half a percent. How are we looking at the gains that we're seeing so far? Yeah, so um, so far, you know, there's a clear and inter interesting gap between onshore investors and offshore investors. Because as you mentioned, we are seeing, you know, onshore markets, CSI 300, erasing earlier losses and edge slightly higher, but Hong Kong keeps falling. Um, but with that in mind, you know, there was the U.S. listed shares overnight also did fall. But I think foreign okay. investors are um, more on the cautious side um, for this. You know, even though GDP target meets uh, has meet the expectations, but they feel like the budget deficit three percent, which is below last year's level, with a slight disappointment. Today them. So what else is the market expecting to hear to help boost gains further? Yeah, so I think um, at the moment, what, um, given the 5% GDP target, what investors are expecting is to see more specific policies boosting, especially with, cons uh, with consumption, uh, such as, you know, for example, like sportswear or like uh, EV, the EV sectors, you know, now that property is no longer that the, the, the most important um, uh, sector to boost China's economy. But with what which we're seeing with market trading today, I think so far, um, all those sectors we've mentioned that was mentioned during uh, the, the work report didn't actually gain that much. And some have actually been failing if you look at the EV makers listed in Hong Kong. So what was more of a, more of a real a bright spot is actually was the defense sector, you know, that we had that over 7 percent budget spending uh, hike. And we see some defense shares gaining today uh, in the onshore market. And Steve, before we let you go, of course, this is Lee Chung's first NPC. What's the tone? What is the key takeaway from his speech? Well, it was, um, you know, the NPC this year is going to be fairly short. It's just going to be seven days. It's usually about 10 days. Uh, and also, of course, you know, there was what was left off uh, the agenda was new appointments. And so we were also expecting over the course of this week an appointment of a new foreign minister. That obviously is not going to happen because it's not on the agenda. And what also is not going to happen is at the end of the NPC, we traditionally get a press conference from the premier. This would have been Li Chang's opportunity to take questions from the, uh, the domestic and international media. It's not going to happen this year. We don't really know the reasons why, uh, but again, it goes back to the point uh, of concern by international investors about the lack of transparency and the lack of, 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 of communication on policy. And this is usually our opportunity to read through the work report, then ask questions of the premier at the end of the NPC. It's not going to happen this year. So this could add fuel more uh, concern from international um, you know, investors who, have, who, who basically invested you know, in FDI, foreign direct investment in China last year 
uh, rose at the lowest uh, pace, uh, what, since 1993. So there's obvious concern, and this will add to the concern about transparency and freedom of, of, of information. Freedom may be a, a, a too strong a word, but you know what I mean, access to information. Stephen Angle, we thank you so much for your insights. Our Chief North Asia Correspondent Stephen Angle in Beijing, braving the rain, braving the snow. And of course, our Asia Agritis reporter Charlotte Yang in Hong Kong. Thank you so much for that. Now let's delve deeper, bring out uh, our guest, Eddie Lowe, CIO of Maybank Group Wealth Management. Eddie, no surprises, but I guess what's key as well is that there were no scares. Yeah, indeed. And largely within our expectations, um, you know, JP growth target of 5%. Uh, is actually signaling the government's ongoing commitment to support growth, right? Having said that, I think the fiscal deficit target is a little bit underwhelming, maybe a little underwhelming for some investors. 3% of GDP, same as last year, whether it's sufficient or not, uh, to meet that growth GDP growth target of 5%, I think that remains to be seen. We suspect that it may need to be notched up a bit higher, like last year, where initially they set a target of 3%, but eventually upgraded it to 3.8%. Mm. What do you make of that special bond, 1 trillion yuan, about $420 million? Well, I think that's part and parcel of this fiscal stimulus and support they needed to... But render. not enough. I suspect, uh, well, it's one trillion, then plus another three point, I think altogether there was a 3.9 trillion number that was being floated around. Uh, but if necessary, I wouldn't be surprised to see more uh, issuance down the road. The question right now is whether China is a buy or not. And here's what Goldman has to say. Given how cheap China appears, people inevitably say, well, has it discounted the worst news? And our view is that one should not invest in China. First and foremost, we think the economy is going to steadily continue to slow down for the next 10 years. That's a very important factor. Second, when we're looking at policy uncertainty, it is not clear what the overall general direction of policy will be long term. Eddie, it is a bold call. Don't buy China. Well, I'm not sure if we are prepared to go out there to say that China is not investable at all. I think if you look at uh, the near-term developments, there have been some encouraging signs as in terms of better policy support as well as coordination. Uh, for example, the announcement of the larger than expected five-year loan prime rate, which is a cut, uh, which is actually a key benchmark interest rate for the property sector. And then the drafting of private sector laws to really promote the private sector economy, I think that is also another encouraging sign. So if we get more policy announcement, I think that you know, could actually help to support a near-term uh, rebound uh, in markets that we have witnessed in February. Now, having said that, uh, I do agree. Uh, there are long-term structural challenges and there is a lack of clarity uh, in terms of, from the policymakers in terms of long-term policy direction. How is China going to transit from an export-driven uh, economy reliant on real estate? Uh, where are the new growth engines uh, that's going to come forth? Uh, the thing is right now, people are talking about China being a tactical play. Mm -hmm. What does it take for China to be a strategic play? We need a long-term game plan, a roadmap from the Chinese policy makers uh, to really say that, hey, uh, we are actually transiting from being reliant on exports, reliant on real estate, invest, uh, infrastructure investments, uh, into something uh, that's more innovation-driven. Uh, I think they talk a little bit about that, trying to promote the technology sector, but I think we really need uh, more uh, details on that. And I mentioned about this private sector law. Uh, I think that is actually quite important, and we are hoping to see more details. How they are exactly are they going to promote the private sector uh, economy? Is it going to be more grants, more incentives, or really just more assurance? for the private entrepreneurs to grow their business. I want to talk about the yuan. It's been pretty stable, but that's because of the fixed things we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. Just how undervalued is the currency? Well, I think uh, it really depends on, on, I think it's two ways. Chinese yuan itself, uh, we have a forecast that is slightly, in terms of dollar yuan, we are expecting the yuan to slightly strengthen from current levels. But that's also premised on the fact that we are expecting the US Fed to cut rates in the second half of this year. But uh, I think longer term, uh, we do think that if 
China economy were to improve from current levels, that should be supportive of the Chinese yuan strength. And of course, we have to talk about Chinese bonds have been quite the darlings for, for investors. Mm -hmm. But that's on the assumption that rate cuts are coming. Mm -hmm. But that's against the backdrop of the Fed also intending to cut rates later in the year. Yeah, indeed. I think uh, we, we are expecting uh, China to really impose a little bit more rate cuts uh, to help to support the economy, be it in terms of uh, loan prime rates, triple R. But having said that, monetary policy enough uh, alone is not enough to support the economy. I think we do need to see more fiscal measures to really drive the economic growth. Okay, before we let you go, for this block at least, where will the CSI 300 end in 2024? We don't have a specific target on that. Uh, Can it outperform? We are looking at actually China, MSCI China indices where we track uh, for our investors. We do think that uh, there's a possibility that it could re rate from nine times forward PE currently to about the average of about 11 times forward PE. Okay, Eddie Hang tight. Eddie Lowe, Maybank Group Wealth Management is sticking around. Still to come, Ray Global Investment shares their market strategy as they see signs of overheating in the Indian stock market. More on the outlook later this hour. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Well, a big week for markets, not just because of NPC, but also because of the non-farm payroll expected in the U.S. this week. As well as Powell's testimony, he is expected to tilt towards a more hawkish tone. Bear in mind, markets pricing in three cuts this year, down from seven. Not much reaction uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, Treasury yields, of course, uh, we saw yields uh, fall four basis points overnight. Currently, 10-year yields at 421.89, pretty stable. Addy Lowe, CIO of Maybank Group Wealth Management, is still with us. Addy, it is a data-dependent Fed, so how crucial is this data this time around? Well, I think the labour market uh, is definitely a key indicator for the Fed. Uh, we do expect the non-farm payrolls to soften. Uh, a little bit this time around from last month's uh, very, very strong data. I think it was, I recall, non-farm payroll addition was three, above 300,000. So this month is going to come in at 200,000, still very robust, which suggests that the Fed is really in no urgency to cut rates. Correct. So can you be confident that three is on the cards, not two, perhaps even two? But, you know, in terms of trajectory for the Fed cuts, I mean, it is there. It is written on the Well, we thought that the market was really too optimistic about rate cuts at the beginning of this year. You, you mentioned about seven rate cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think at this juncture, we are still penciling in uh, four rate cuts from the Fed um, starting in July. And that's on the or really on the premise, on the basis that uh, we are still going to see continued disinflation uh, in tandem with slowing and moderating growth for the U.S. economy. So do you start taking duration as a strategy? What do you do? Well, for fixed income, we do believe that 10-year Treasury yields is going to lower or retreat in tandem with uh, policy rates. So duration is something that we are prepared to take and adopt. In fact, I think that's going to be supportive for fixed income returns as well. But we did highlight to some investors who are a bit more concerned about the near-term rates volatility because 10-year Treasury could bounce around uh, that 4 to 4.5% range. So if you, do, you, if you are really concerned about that, take a barbell approach in duration, have some long-term bonds, but at the same time, two, three-year IG bonds, I think that should also provide some defensive carry as well. How much in terms of uh, equities? S&P tested new highs 15 times this year. You've got to wonder, I mean, how long can this euphoria last and should that be consolidation soon? Well, I mean, developed market, be it US, Europe, uh, or even the Nikkei 225 in Japan, I think those are really testing record highs. So we did point out in our latest monthly outlook report that if you look at the VIX index, which is a represent or proxy for US market equi uh, equity market volatility, is actually near historical trough. So we won't be surprised to see some consolidation, profit taking. And this is the reason why we are emphasizing that, hey, investors do need to look beyond that magnificent seven or fabulous five. Uh, look really focus on sector diversification as well as margin of safety. Diversify into? So, so we are actually proposing to say, yes, I think within the tech sector there are still some value, but other sectors such as healthcare, uh, energy, and lately we have added materials stocks also into our preferred sectors. I think those are, there are interesting opportunities to look there. How do you play Japan? 
Well, Japan Nikkei 225, very, very robust this year. Um, 40,000 broke that levels. I think it's going to be we, the ongoing corporate reforms, including more share buybacks, plus the very easy monetary policy. I think that's going to be supportive of Japanese equities. Having said that, if you look at the valuation now on a price earnings basis, uh, it is slightly above uh, historical average valuation. So similar to the US, I think there's a need to be more active and selective. Maybe look for an active fund manager that has a strong track record to pick the right stocks and look for a laggard sector plays, healthcare, industrials, uh, energy, for example. Those are the sectors that we are looking at. And as we see more inflows into the equity sector in Japan, what would that mean for yen? It's been pretty lackluster among mm -hmm. the worst performers in Asia. Why is that so and how much more upside? Well, for the Japanese yen, is really contingent on the Bank of Jap uh, Japan monetary policy. We do expect the Bank of Japan to exit as a negative interest rate policy sometime in the second quarter this year. But having said that, uh, exiting doesn't mean very aggressive tightening. March or April, second quarter? Well, I think we are looking at April, if I recall correctly. Uh, but it's really dependent on, I think one of the key events that we're watching is the Shunto wage negotiations. Uh, if obviously the numbers or the growth, wage growth is coming higher than expected, uh, then it gives a reason for the BOJ to act faster. And fundamentals are in place to support uh, a further rally in the Nikkei 225? The Nikkei 225 in terms of corporate reforms, I think that is something that has been very constructive and supportive uh, for the Japanese equities and probably you get a bit more, more of that. But one thing I, I think we, we also highlighted to our investors is on the political development because uh, the current Prime Minister with uh, LDP, uh, they are actually facing uh, September election uh, and there's a chance that the Prime Minister may not get re-elected given some concerns around him in terms of support levels or ratings. So if that were to happen, it could create some uncertainty about policy continuity and right. could create some volatility in Japanese markets. Beware. Eddie Lowe, Maybank Group Wealth Management, we thank you so much for your insights today. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back, and here are some top global stories we're following. The Philippines says one of its Coast Guard vessels has collided with a Chinese ship while supporting a military resupply mission. In a post on X, the Philippine Coast Guard showed video of the incident and said its ships faced dangerous maneuvers and blocking from Chinese Coast Guard vessels and Chinese maritime militia. The post did not reveal the exact location of the incident. Some of China's largest insurers are said to be sounding the alarm over the debt risks of China Vanka. That's the shares and bonds of the developer hit record lows on repayment concerns. Sources say at least two Beijing-based insurers are closely monitoring Vanka's credit risks. The builder recently started negotiations with state insurers to extend maturities of some private borrowings. And of course, uh, China kicks off its NPC. Uh, this week, we have defense stocks in focus in particular defense spending being boosted by 7.2 percent this year and that is the highest in about five years some say uh, the defense budget was a slight let down but enough for the moment we're seeing gains pretty much across the board this is Bloomberg. environment that is more complex, severe and uncertain. And the growth at home is not solid enough and the expectation is low and many a small and the medium-sized enterprises face difficulties in their operation. And we have seen the pressures from overall job creation and employment problems. And they also weak links for us to further enhance. And there is room for the government to improve its work. 
Canada with Chinese Premier Li Qiang on China's external headwinds. China markets just heading to lunch. We're seeing the CSI 300 index in positive territory reversing the losses which we saw uh, earlier this morning. The MPC starts with 2024 growth targets set at around 5%. Some say it is ambitious. Premier Li Qiang said it himself. Uh, China sees uh, 3% CPI pays 2024 budget deficit at 3% of GDP. And some say also that it is pretty uninspiring. Shanghai Com currently up by three tenths of one percent. Of course, Chinese benchmarks have uh, made gains in recent weeks, but it was a torrid year in 2023. Li Chang again saying achieving that 2024 target's not an easy task. Growth target of around 5% front and center. Defense spending up by about 7.2%, the highest in about five years. Now, let's get back to the MPC underway in Beijing. Bloomberg's China government reporter, Colin Murphy, is at the Great Hall of People covering the event. And Colin, your key takeaways from Premier Li's opening speech. I would say if I had to sum it up in like two words, it would be pretty subdued. Uh, the opening ceremony has actually concluded around a half an hour ago, and I'm standing outside the Great Hall as we speak, and already the delegates have, have left and the press and media have gone. Um, so basically, uh, people just trying to digest uh, the work report and try to make sense of it. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the targets of 5%. Um, Coming across is quite ambitious, given the fact that last year was such a high base. Um, then the sort of the mention of the ultra-long special government bonds and uh, that acknowledgement of uh, the challenges that China do does face. So it's, it's, it's not easy for us to realize these targets, and we need policy support and joint efforts from all fronts. So basically, I think one of the things that we're kind of you know, after we've had a little bit of time to digest it and think about it, it's like the gap between what is essentially a very ambitious um, GDP growth target and then the lack of details and the lack of specifics, especially uh, when it comes to things like boosting consumer or, you know, reassuring private sector. Uh, you know, very, very little detail. In fact, uh, pretty much zero on that. So, uh, you know, again, pinning the hopes on this technological transformation uh, so it will it will really be a difficult one for them to uh, deliver on this ambitious growth if we don't see uh, more aggressive sort of uh, uh, stimulus in the coming uh, months, weeks and months. And Colm, what is the sense on the ground? This is the first time that foreign uh, reporters have been allowed in, in in quite a number of years. Yes, uh, there's a lot of people who are here from overseas. The government has issued quite a number of what they call J2 visas. And uh, obviously, you know, it's uh, no longer COVID. So the restrictions uh, seem very, very uh, minimal compared to last year. I saw nobody wearing a mask or very few people, shall I say, wearing a mask in, in the Great Hall. And uh, generally, the sort of the procedures were pretty straightforward. But on the one hand, you know, it is relatively and everything is relative here because it's still you know challenging for reporters to cover the event uh, but on the one hand you do see these signs of, of uh, relaxation a little bit but on the other hand then of course yesterday monday they announced that the uh, presser press conference with lee chang uh, which was you know typically happen every year for uh, at least since the 1990s uh, has been cancelled. And, you know, that's an important sort of opportunity for media to get to know a little bit more, uh, you know, the Premier and also, uh, you know, grill him a little bit more on how he would like to achieve uh, these lofty goals that he set out in terms of GDP. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of like a negative. But on the positive side, uh, there has been some relaxation in terms of access. And in terms of the next steps, what are we anticipating? Already Li Chiang has grabbed that uh, presser. I mean, what are you hoping to hear? So basically it's the issue, you know, it's like now we need to see the specifics and, you know, perhaps uh, in the interest of caution, uh, they have taken a very uh, cautionary stance at this time of the year, uh, trying to minimize risk. And maybe as the year progresses, 
we might see a sort of a loosening up of that and, and more uh, rollout of, of different targets. But right now, it's quite it's kind of difficult to see what is the next steps in terms of uh, how this is going to roll out. And also, uh, you know, it'll take a little while for people to uh, sort of figure out exactly what this means for them, their investments and, uh, you know, their, their, their commitment to the China market in general. Bloomberg's China government reporter Colin Murphy there. We thank you so much for your insights. And we have uh, breaking news out of Thailand. Thailand's uh, consumer uh, price index falling 0.77% year on year. That is better than anticipated. The estimate was for 0.8%. Of course, uh, Thailand in a spell of deflation, negative consumer price readings for four months since October. And uh, that is... Uh, CPI data coming in uh, better, slightly better than anticipated, 0.77 versus 0.8 percent year on year. The Thai baht, of course, has been on a downward spiral among the worst performers here in Asia. Let's talk more on markets, bring in our FX and rate strategies. David Finetti here. Let's start on Thailand. The Thai baht has been uh, pretty lackluster. Where does it go from here? Yeah, certainly the data today, so it was in line pretty much with estimates, but more than likely it's going to keep pressure from the government on the Bank of Thailand to cut rates sometime in there soon. I don't think that's going to go anywhere soon. If you go back to the recent decision, two uh, of the Bank of Thailand members did say that we are prepared to a rate cut. So if there is a rate cut in the near future, then obviously that's what we bar positive, particularly if Fed Chair Powell and certainly if the Federal Reserve uh, pushes back against this idea of rate cuts anytime soon. So the markets will be looking at that Fed dot plot. If that comes in with three or you never know, even two rate cuts, then obviously that's strong for the dollar, which is bad news for the BART. So keep pre so either way you look at it, I think pressure on the BART will remain in the near term. All right, time to start making a trip to Bangkok, perhaps. For for the yen, I mean, hovering at 150, breach 150 just for a little while, but back above 150 now. Yeah, it's in a very tight range because if you look for the upside, basically, obviously there's threats of intervention coming in there. On the downside, it's like how much further can it go? Because the BOJ, while they're expected to change the policy, the market's already factoring that in. It's a question of when, not if. With April the front runner, but it, it could already be July if the Bank of Japan wants to wait for as much data as it can on wages. But again, even when it does, the market's going to look more well, factored in. Some people are expecting that that Bank of, Ch Bank of Japan change like Unicredit are saying that that could see Dolly in going to 140. Other people aren't quite as certain because they're going, well, look, even when it does change policy, it's not, Bank of Japan isn't indicating that it's going to be in its stance of an aggressive rate hikes. If you look at Ushida, the deputy governor, he referred to a chart last month that had 50 basis points of hikes over the next two years <laughs> in when it got to zero. So that's hardly going, hey, let's go gangbusters. So I think they'll be looking for the idea of if the Bank of Japan, when it does change its stance, how aggressive is it? If it's not too aggressive, again, yen's upsize limited. And again, if, if, if Federal Reserve sticks to its three dot plots, shall we say three rate cuts this year, then that's already factored in the markets. Dolly yen could stay in a tight range soon. And the yuan, uh, can this MPC give a lift to the currency? It's given very little lift today. There's been very little reaction to it. And again, I think most of that's because it's been expected. What has come out has not really shocked the markets, been pre programmed into it. I think the bigger catalyst, certainly in the near term, will be what Fed Chair Powell says tomorrow on this basically what's called this used to be his Humphrey Hawkins speech, semi annual speech. Um, how hawkish does he sound? You know, is it that three cuts? Is it less? Or is it maybe, does he open the door maybe for four? So I think whatever he says will be the bigger catalyst, I think, for the dollar and hence the other currencies including you are higher for longer we have had that before he is likely to remain hawkish our affects and rate strategies david finetti there thank you so much for your insights still to come ray global investments tells us why they think broader indian markets are overheated more in the outlook next keep it here with us this is Bloomberg. <laughs>
the top names in climate finance are on Bloomberg. I can't tell whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about climate finance. A lot of great stuff is happening, but is it enough? No, it's not enough. I'm biased. I'm a huge investor in, in both fission and fusion and hoping that it comes in time. Transition is not going to be an event. Mm. It's a process. But at the end of the day, it's the right thing for the planet. It's the right thing for the industry. And there is business opportunity. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets Asia. You're watching India Focus. Futures pointing to a lower open when India starts trading in about four minutes from here. Sunsex down about a tenth of one percent. I remember that this is a market that surged 20% last year, helping India to be the fastest growing major economy. Nifty Futures pointing to a lower open in terms of uh, the Indian rupee. Of course, that's the one we're watching on the back of uh, the Indian economy going gangbusters in excess of 8% growth in 20. 2023. Of course, there are risks out there, and overtly hawkish RBI is among them. One stock we're watching, Tata Motors, pre market up about 4%. We're watching this stock in particular, uh, is looking to unlock value for investors. It's planning to split its passenger as well as commercial businesses. The process may take as long as 15 months. Tata Motors up about 4% right now on the back of that news. Now let's stay with India. Let's get more on Indian markets with Banaifa Malanka, CIO of the family office Ray Global Investments. Malaika, good to have you with us. We talk about gains for the Indian market. How much more upside from here? Oh, uh, well, it's been a stupendous year for the markets here, uh, definitely. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's backed by the earnings season, which has been very robust. Uh, we saw a Q3 earnings season, which was very uh, supported by energy and metals uh, contributing to profitability, uh, whereas IT and FMCG was a little slow. But uh, our markets have been, uh, uh, you know, kind of their EPS growth for FR25 is again priced in at 1131 rupees, which is 19% CAGR uh, growth for the last five years since FY20. So, yes, I think the momentum is on and uh, uh, remains to be seen where we actually kind of uh, consolidate in some range. Like you said, energy metals have done well, but not so for tech. I mean, unlike the counterparts in the U.S., can tech, Indian tech, play catch up this year? Uh, I would think, Hislinda, it would be the second half of the year. Uh, definitely not the first, more towards the, uh, you know, uh, quarter three results. Uh, uh, because I think it's very linked to, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. markets and uh, what the developed markets are giving us as contracts because they are IT firms which, uh, you know, are more services oriented. So I think once the uh, U.S. Fed decides to kind of go a little slower on their rate, rather start cutting rates, that is when, uh, uh, you know, we will see a little bit of uptick in IT. And I'm also wondering what impact that blowout GDP data will have on the markets, or has that played out already? Oh, yes. Uh, we were all in for a very, uh, very pleasant surprise with the 8.4 number, which came in a few days ago, uh, which has actually pushed all our estimates to go up to a growth of 7.6 this year. I was hearing the speaker just in a session earlier, and he was suggesting that China is aiming for five. So definitely we are up there uh, as far as the growth trajectory is concerned. Uh, the momentum on the ground is very, very strong. So it seems positive. Uh, but the only thing the heavy lifting has been done by the government so far in the last uh, 18 months, a lot of CapEx has gone in, which is why the growth numbers have come up. Uh, I think it's now time for the private sector to take in. And uh, uh, that's when we will see the next leg of growth. Mm. In terms of playing India's growth story, where do you still see value? Um, I would definitely think it would be in pockets. I've spoken of this earlier on the show. Uh, I'm still very positive on power. Um, second half of the year, I think we should be better off on IT as well. Uh, and one sector which I think which will have some uh, uh, robust reforms, etc., which will, you know, this government which is likely to get, uh, the incumbent which is likely to come in again is uh, uh, suggesting some very large reforms. And uh, uh, tourism should pick up in a very big way in India is my sense as well. And in terms of risk, I'm looking at Brent crude trading above 80 bucks a barrel right now. India imports most of its oil needs. I mean, how much of a risk? Is oil on the Indian market? 
Oh, if I can just keep repeating, that's the biggest risk that India has as far as all the projections are concerned. It's crude, crude and crude for us. Uh, because whilst we are uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of splitting our, uh, you know, uh, inward flows from crude from where they're coming and how it's happening, I think uh, there are various, uh, various uh, reports which I, uh, I have read, which are also suggesting 95, to a do 95 barrels to a dollar, et cetera, which would be quite dampening towards the growth in India. But now, if I, you talked earlier about how you're keeping tabs on the Fed, how are you keeping tabs on the RBI? Might it relook at its hawkish stance? Uh, I would think uh, with uh, elections coming up in May, there would be no immediate stance change in the uh, in the quarter in the you know first half of this year. Uh, my sense is that uh, RBI would give about maybe a rate a rate cut or so, uh, which is around uh, October uh, this year, because it's pre Diwali season. Diwali is a consumer season for India, and I'm sure if they want to maintain the growth momentum and have the private sector, you know, contribute towards uh, putting up capex, I think that would be a rough about time which they would come about with a rate cut, provided that the Fed actually walks the talk in June July. The thing is, there are concerns that the high cost of borrowing might impact growth. How are you assessing that risk? Uh, well, I think we're already there. Uh, most of the high cost is already priced in, as I would see, and still we have markets which are flying. Uh, markets are flying because we are getting a lot of flows from retail investors in India. And finally, uh, you know, our uh, middle class is starting to understand the power of equity uh, in India. Uh, the flows which have been so robust in the last year have uh, actually weathered the storm of not having FII flows in India at all. And uh, that's actually the trend which is changing here from uh, plain vanilla bank deposits to coming up to equity markets. Mm. So the biggest risk for the market would be then, Benaifa? Uh, I think, of course, crude being one and, of course, retail flows, which will slow in as well if the markets don't perform. Uh, there is a little bit of froth building up in the derivatives market in India. I think that has to be watched uh, because they are, I would say, a, not more informed investors in that space. So I think that would be the biggest tail risk that we have at this point in time. And geopolitics and the election coming up in India mid-year? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think election, I think, is just we need to see uh, what is the uh, seat strength that the uh, government kind of comes back with. Uh, geopolitical is a very commonly spoken of risk. I think it's around everywhere. I think one thing that is very specific to India, which might matter, is the fiscal roadmap uh, which the government intends to follow, uh, which they did state in the interim budget. They are uh, likely to get it down to their targets uh, as per plan. Uh, but I think the budget in July will suggest where is it that they're actually looking to kind of take this ahead for the next four or five years. So yeah, I think fiscal roadmap should be the one which will help us in ratings and eventually help us in getting more participation from the world economies. Benaifa, thank you so much for being with us. Benaifa Malanka, CIO of Ray Global Investments. Three minutes into the Indian trading day, and we're seeing that Indian stocks are under pressure at this point in time. Again, bear in mind, it's up 20% already. So uh, the losses here is just a matter of consolidation. We're keeping a watch on Tata Motors, by the way, are looking to unlock value for investors, planning to split its passenger as well as commercial businesses. The process likely to take about 15 months. Tata Motors up about 3% as we speak. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Asian markets under pressure. The MSCI Asia Pac index is in negative territory, tracking losses overnight on Wall Street. It is about the MPC, but it's also about the Fed as well as the non farm payroll expected in the US this week. Bear in mind, Powell set to testify he is likely to tilt towards a hawkish tone. The Hang Seng. Under pressure, down 1.9 percent, dragged down by tag. The Nikkei 225 consolidating at 40,132. It breached 40,000 and went down below, and now it's back up above 40. STI under pressure, along with the Cosby index. Let's talk crypto. Take a look where we are 
in terms of this asset class, topping 67,000, close to an all-time high. The level we're watching at 68,991.85. That was the level reach in 2021. The Galaxy Crypto Index currently surging by more than 6%. Let's talk all things crypto. Markets reporter Avril Hong is with us. So what's behind this frenzy. It's a frenzy indeed. It is crypto mania. It is a phenomenal run and the original cryptocurrency, the biggest among them, Bitcoin, has run up about 60% since the start of the year. And as to your question as to why we're seeing this, I think it's boiling down to the three Fs. First of them, the Fed. Uh, it's the macroeconomic backdrop and how the US Central Bank has made it quite clear we're not going to see further hikes. It's done with it. Uh, we might see some marginal moves based on Fed speakers. I mean, we heard from Bostic. We're going to hear from Powell later in the week. But overall, it is the sense that we're done with those hikes. And then funds. Uh, there is that sense that, of expectation for robust demand from exchange-traded funds. And then let's not forget, I think the last, but probably one of the most important, the fear of missing out and how we're seeing investors really piling in, particularly from retail investors. This price action that we're seeing actually mirrors what we're seeing in the last uh, part of 2020 as well as 2021, that extreme optimism and that bullishness. So that is why we're seeing this crypto mania and the way that Bitcoin is faring uh, this year. Of course, beware, beware. They have been burnt big time before. We talk about how Bitcoin is uh, whiskers away from an all-time high. Meme coins along for the ride. Yes, whiskers is a very fitting <laughs> word to use because the original meme coin, the OG among them, the one with the Shiba Inu on the face of the meme coin, that has been outperforming the performance of BTC. Uh, and we're seeing how investors, the retail ones, have been trying to look for cheaper coins amid the overarching digital coin frenzy. And this has also meant that other animal themed coins such as Pepe, the frog themed one, dog with hat, which is literally a dog with a hat on a meme coin, uh, those have come along for the ride. And we're seeing that it's interesting the way that investors have been playing into it via contracts. So a thousand tokens for uh, futures uh, that helps to ex uh, exacerbate the big price moves in these meme coins. Uh, but note here, and to your point also, uh, the previous rallies in similar meme coins have mostly foreshadowed their peaks. Uh, although I think this time around, they believe it's different because of the Bitcoin halving, which could mean less supply in the market. But yeah. As of say. course, we've, we've talked about that before, about this time it being different. And, you know, to your point, 68, 9.91, is the level we're looking at. And some are projecting an even higher record for, for Bitcoin. Absolutely. I mean, there are options players that think 70,000 uh, is in the offing. So there's certainly a lot of bullishness uh, behind these moves. I can't help but feel beware. April Hong, <laughs> thank you so much for that. Let's do a check on where markets are at this point in time. Of course, caution is uh, the word to watch out for in terms of how markets uh, are waiting for that Fed, um, Jerome Powell's uh, testimony, as well as that uh, non-farm payroll. In terms of the markets that we're looking at and some of the players, uh, China property stocks in particular, China Vanka, are one to uh, watch, currently down about 3% at this point in time. Take a look at where we are in terms of the broad the market as well. Uh, apart from Chinese insurers, warning of debt risk at property giant Vanka. We're also keeping a track on the MSCI Asia Pank Index currently uh, in um, negative territory down about half a percent. New in focus as well. It is out with our earnings uh, after the bell, currently down by three and a half percent. Again, Asia Pack stocks halting a three day rally, currently down two tenths of one percent as we await great, greater clarity from that NPC as well as uh, data out of the US. Uh, this is how it's looking in terms of the various uh, benchmarks. We have um, the uh, benchmark in Hong Kong currently down about almost 2%, dragged down by a uh, tag. We have Tyx though, uh, in the opposite direction, higher by 7 tenths of 1%. That is it from Bloomberg Markets Asia. Daybreak Middle East and Africa is next. Do keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg.